Good afternoon, I'm Herman Green with the Midday News. A special welcome to those of you watching on OneSpotMedia.com. A reminder as well that you can download our OneSpot Media app in the Google Play Store or the App Store. That's the number one, followed by the word Spot Media. Parliament on Tuesday failed to pass a bill which will see changes to the building standards in the country. TVJ's Jillian Pearson has the details on why. It's a critical piece of legislation which stakeholders in the building sector have said is long overdue. The bill is shortly entitled Building Bill 2017. It gives powers to the parish councils to, among other things, monitor construction developments ensuring all standards are obeyed. Over the last few weeks, parliamentarians have been debating aspects of the legislation, a debate which came to a close Tuesday. The next step was for the MPs to go to the committee stage, and that they did, going clause by clause through the bill. Clause 33 of the bill posed the problem. As far as the monitoring of construction, it reads, the authorities may do an investigation. The word may was the first bone of contention. When you say that the authorities may inspect something, they do so if they so desire. When you say they shall, it becomes the obligation of the authorities to go and do it. Local government minister Desmond McKenzie, however, stated that there are mechanisms in place for accountability. The approvals that are granted comes with conditions, Mr. Speaker. And that is why many times you find developers complaining because they are not adhering to the conditions of approval. Someone who was a practitioner in this field, both locally and abroad, I believe it ought to be mandatory. Abroad, it was mandatory. It's not a me, and as a practitioner, I believe it ought to be mandatory. And the word should be shall. This parliament has an obligation to protect the interests of the people. And I support the point made by Member Warmington. Because, yes, but it's a, it's an error. Yeah, we need to, yeah, yeah. So, so we're going to correct it now. So we need to, we need, so we need to correct it. Yeah. We're going to correct it. Yeah. Correct it. I, I, yeah. you see, the, see the correction here? We have two, we started with you. We have two corrections inside here. Mr. Scott. Yeah, but there's one. We have two corrections, and that is one of them. The back and forth would go on for some time. The minister then decided to consult with his technocrats. On his return, permission was granted for May to be replaced with shall, but even as the House proceeded with their deliberations on the clauses, more issues were identified. By then, it was after 5 p.m., and there were other matters down on the Parliament agenda. The committee is expected to pick up from where it left off at the next parliamentary sitting. Jeline Pearson, TVJ News. Prime Minister Andrew Holness has called on the private sector to partner with the government in finding a solution to affordable housing for low-income earners. The Prime Minister made the call during the opening ceremony of a three-day regional housing conference in Montego Bay, St. James. Mr. Holness says that a rapid, urbanizing of, rapid urbanization is putting an increased pressure on the capacity of the public and the private sector to deliver the housing needs of Jamaica. He says that this creates the perfect environment for informal settlements to flourish. This challenge of informal settlements, given an urban context, requires a multi-pronged approach to include strategies that increase the supply of affordable housing solutions and striking greater partnerships with the private sector to develop housing solutions that are within reach of every single incumbent. The Prime Minister reiterated that affordable housing continues to be a major challenge for low-income earners who oftentimes spend most of their income on transportation. Meanwhile, Mr. Holness says Jamaica is now deliberate in its strategy of linking housing solutions with cities and urban areas with high growth and employment potential. As such, plans are, are being established for a third city. Are now recognized as a good thing. It wasn't always the case. But more and more governments are recognizing that cities can be made sustainable, resilient, and 
a place where governments can cater to the well-being of populations. The Prime Minister also added that within the next two weeks, Jamaica is expected to pass the new building code, which is being debated in Parliament. At least five schools in Trelawney have been affected as residents mounted roadblocks for the second day this morning. Angry residents took to the streets yesterday and today, blocking several roadways leading into the parish. Residents say they are frustrated with the poor road conditions which they have been experiencing for several years. Most schools are now seeing less than 50% turnout or have been forced to close their doors. The schools affected are Mushet, William Nib, and the Holland High Schools, as well as the Granville and Wakefield Primary Schools. Principal of Granville Primary, Ivanhoe Gordon, says his school has been tremendously affected. Yesterday we were down about 50%. Today I, we are low, you know, because quite a number of our students come from that catchment area and the impact across, you know, some persons would have been pulled their children out of security concerns, not knowing what could happen later on. The was livid about the road conditions. 69 right and when from 1969 until now they have never fixed this road right they only come about patch the path wall pick and choose where they want to patch right they patch one and left the other one right and when we drive in a taxi we have a ball out and the telejiver drive and take time when we come out of the taxi i'll pain in my back right because of the bad road condition affect Areas affected are the Granville Main Road, Dumfries to Wakefield, as well as the Bounty Hall Main Road. Our team had to park their vehicle and were taken by bike to the area where the residents were demonstrating. One of the suspects who engaged a policewoman in a gun battle at her home in Portmore St. Catherine last month has been charged. 22-year-old Ryan Thomas, a chef of Little Lane in Central Village St. Catherine, was charged on Wednesday after he was pointed out on identification parade. Mr. Thomas has been charged with three counts of wounding with intent, three counts of shooting, and illegal possession of a firearm and ammunition. The police inspector and two of her children, one of them a 17-year-old student, were shot in the attack. However, she was able to shoot two of the intruders. One of them, Kayon Edwards, died on the spot. Mr. Thomas, who was shot in the chest, was arrested hours later when he turned up at the Kingston Public Hospital for treatment. He's booked to appear in court next week. It is reported that on September 26, the policewoman and her children were at their home in Portmore when the three men armed with guns entered the yard. This led to an exchange of gunfire between the robbers and the policewoman. The injured cop and her children were recently released from hospital. The cops are searching for the third suspect. CTOC investigators are today expected to begin questioning a suspect held in connection with Tuesday's major arms and ammunition find at the Kingston Freeport Terminal. The suspect was arrested hours after the cops seized 19 illegal guns and 4,000 assorted rounds of ammunition in a shipment from the United States. Six high-powered rifles and 13 handguns were found in freezers reportedly shipped to the suspect. The New York Police Department is offering a reward of $10,000 U.S. for information leading to the capture of the culprits who killed an elderly Jamaican man and, his, and injured his wife in Brooklyn last Wednesday. Police are still here gathering evidence from the home. The victim's family members tell us that they had just seen the couple on Sunday for a family reunion. They say they are a very close family and this home invasion turned homicide is devastating. to me. He grew me up in Jamaica. Carlene Gross says she last saw her uncle Waldeman Thompson on Sunday at a family gathering, not knowing at the time it would be her last visit with him. Oh my God. Uh, Waldeman Thompson, he doesn't deserve to die like this and this brutality what they did to him. It's terrible. It's terrible. 
Police say the 91-year-old Thompson and his 100-year-old wife, Ethelyn, were targeted during a home invasion here on Decatur Street in Bedford-Stuyvesant, Brooklyn. Sources say Ethelyn was walking into their ground floor apartment when several men followed her and pushed her in. The men allegedly tied up the couple and ransacked the house, possibly looking for a large sum of cash. Sources say the couple owns the building and collects rent from several tenants. Once the suspects left, Ethelyn was able to free herself and call for help. Upon the officer's arrival, they were met by a female who identified herself as being the 911 caller as well as the homeowner. This female further stated that unknown people entered her apartment and tied her and her husband up. Police found Waldeman Thompson still tied up on the floor, but unresponsive. Despite CPR efforts, he was pronounced dead at a nearby hospital. His wife, seen inside this ambulance, was treated at the scene. At the time, she didn't know her husband had passed away. I don't even have the words. Because two people in their 90s, you know, come on. Now family members hope for justice. They are very godly people. And I whosoever did something like this, they deserve to be punished real hard. Say there were no signs of force. Sources tell us that police are searching for possibly four suspects in this case. Police say they are still trying to determine the exact cause of death for 91-year-old Waldeman Thompson. As for his 100-year-old wife, family tells us that she is still recovering at a hospital. Church groups in the St. Andrews South Police Division are calling for corporate entities to join in the crime-fighting effort in that division. The groups had a peace march in the area hours before two unrelated incidents, which left two persons dead and several others homeless. On Heroes Day, members of the police high command joined with residents of Olympic Gardens, counselors, as well as church groups, including Martha Ministries International, for a church for a concert and walkthrough encouraging peace for several crime-plagued communities. However, after that march, Eight houses were burned to the ground early the following morning, and two persons shot dead at a bar late Tuesday night. While being optimistic on Monday, Superintendent of Police Dwight Powell, in charge of community safety and security for the St. Andrew South Police Division, admitted that more action is needed in these communities. This one-off effort will not stem the crime and violence that we are having. But we believe that when, especially the law-abiding people uh, from the churches unite, we will see some result. The church groups are also calling for more corporate entities to join in the combined effort to rid these and other inner city communities of violent crimes. In news overseas, the United States Mideast envoy said Hamas should disarm and recognize Israel if it is to join a Palestinian unity government with rival groups Fatah. It's the first comment from the U.S. following the landmark agreement between the two factions last week. We go to the CNN for more. The thanks from both Fatah and Hamas, the delegations that are still in Cairo and have been for the last few days, a lot of that thanks was de directed right at Egypt for hosting these talks and pushing them forward. Not only these direct talks between the two sides, but also indirect talks last month and their efforts over the course of the recent past year to make this happen and to bring together these two bitter rivals and create a national unity government. But there wasn't much more in the statements, thanking each other, thanking the Palestinian people. But in terms of details, what does this look like and what are the concessions the two sides have made towards each other to bridge what had seemed like unbridgeable gaps? We don't know much there because the statement simply didn't include them. There was talk of border crossings. The Palestinian Authority, which is Fatah, which governs the West Bank, will take over the border crossings. That was a big issue for Hamas and a major concession. But there was no discussion of what happens to Hamas's military wing, the Al-Qassam brigades, and what happens to their weaponry. In addition, what about stance on big diplomatic issues? For example, a position on Israel. Will Hamas moderate their position at all? Those are the questions we still have at this point, as well as other questions. For example, what happens to Hamas employees in Gaza? Do they become Palestinian Authority employees? And what happens to their salaries? All of this needs to be hammered out if it hasn't been hammered out already. Those details, and it's the details where previous reconciliation attempts have fallen apart in the past, those details need to be put forward and they need to work out for this attempt at reconciliation, for this attempt at a national unity government to hold. And we go now to sports. Steph Curry and the 2016-17 NBA champions, the Golden State Warriors, were beaten on the opening night of the new season 122-121 by the James Harden-led Houston Rockets. Curry had 22 points and Kevin Durant 20 as Nick Young led all scorers off the champs with 23 off the bench. 
Runners-up and early favorites, the Cleveland Cavaliers, led by LeBron James, secured a three-point victory, 102-99, to over Kyrie Irving's Boston Celtics. The win for Cleveland was overshadowed by the gruesome injury to Celtics All-Star forward Gordon Hayward, who suffered a broken ankle and fractured tibia less than six minutes into the game. LeBron James led the way with 29 points, 16 rebounds, and 9 assists for the Cavs. And that's the Midday News. I'm Herman Green. Join us at 7 for the Primetime News Package. On behalf of the news, sports, and production teams, good afternoon.